Andrew, we haven't met yet. <laughs> That's true. Hi, Gertrude. Great to see you. Yeah. Where are, where are you? In Germany, north of Frankfurt. North of Frankfurt. Yeah, I don't actually know where Frankfurt is. I, I wasn't in the middle. Right in the middle of, of yeah, Germany. I, I think of Nuremberg in the middle, but that's not true. Nuremberg is south. It's okay. three hours from me south. Wow, okay. So it's so an hour from, from Munich or so. An hour from Munich, okay. Okay, I know where I'm yeah. Four hours? Four hours from yeah, Munich. Yeah, I'm, I'm in half hours. Yeah, four and a half. Yeah. I will have to look it up on the map. Cool. Because somebody else was in Frankfurt. Uh, Jürgen liked. 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 Some, Jürgen. some Americans know um, Gießen because it was a military base. I'm Canadian. I mean. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> uh, are you in Canada now? Andrew? Yeah. Yes, yes. Where about? Near Ottawa, so north of New York State. Um, yeah, just north of the Great Lakes. You know those big lakes there? Just north of that, yeah. I have been um, au pair. Oh. Um, 75 <laughs> um, in Buffalo, New York. Oh, no. Yeah. So. It's maybe, maybe three hours away, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lake in the middle, so I'm on the other side of Lake Ontario. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Hi. Okay. This is my first, uh, I've been to GC, my third GCC meeting, and I followed some Facebook posts, but it's my first unblocking call. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um we there's many ways you we can go about it i guess some, sometimes it's sort of been more informal talk and other times we've kind of explored the theme but um but uh it's basically it's been a little bit about triggers uh, sort of emotional reactions and sort of maybe what could be a useful attitude towards uh, that um ways of dealing with it when it happens and maybe ways of avoiding typical problems so so it's a very rich area uh, i think it's a very interesting theme yeah are there any thoughts you have about it or or things that you would be interested in in looking at Uh, before we start, may I just ask, are we expecting anybody else? And did you did you do the check-in yet? Um, no, uh, I haven't um, done the check-in yet. Um, but um, I'm not sure if, if anyone else is coming. I, I spoke to Sam a little earlier, so he was he asked if I could be host of this. And I think um, so he's in the UK. And I think Tammy is uh, traveling somewhere too, so uh, there, there may not be any others, but I mean, we, we will see sometime if someone just shows up, so, but, um, but yeah, I'm uh, here in Norway, so, uh, and uh, beautiful uh, spring time now, really warm, and uh, I've just been out most of the day. And um, yeah, now just um, just came came uh, home uh, not not so long ago, really. And um, and um, basically, uh, I don't have any any specific um, things that I thought about uh, to talk about today. So I'm kind of sort of see, seeing what comes up, I guess. But it's uh, it's a lot of really interesting things uh, with unblocking that could could be worth looking into for sure. Yeah, 
Maybe I'll just check in uh, a little bit, first of all. Um, so yes, here too in Canada, it's beautiful springtime uh, after a long, longer than usual winter, I think. The, uh, the tulips are uh, just out the last few days. They're quite lovely. They don't last very long. We make a big deal of them here in Canada mm. because uh, we had, uh, especially around Ottawa, because the princess um, from the Netherlands stayed in Ottawa, uh, quite close to where I grew up, actually, during the war. And so Holland gives a million tulips to uh, some, some huge number to Ottawa every year. So we have a big tulip festival. I'm not in Ottawa. I'm in a small town an hour away, but still tulips are everywhere here now. So it's colorful and warm and I haven't been out today. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm looking forward to going out um, uh, on my bike probably after. Uh, I do, uh, I have much more things that I do online than I do, um, I have many more connections and exciting things online than I do in my actual life in this town. Uh, I'm a writer and among other things. So I work away at my projects um, and uh, um, yeah. So, Carl. Hey, Carl. Hello. Hi. We're, we're checking in, Carl. I was just finishing checking in there. Uh, oh. Andrew, Andrew in Canada. Hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, saying that um, a beautiful spring day here, and I'm feeling some of that. Looking, looking forward to, um, yeah, there's a lot of joy in the air from the spring, from the weather, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting into that. And I'm feeling pretty good. Um, Excited about this subject. Um, uh, I see unblocking as being a part of creating, or the best way to unblock is to create um, something. So, but I'll look forward to talking about it. Over. Uh, Glenn, can you mute? Uh, you're um, making noise. Yeah, I'm finished with that. Tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, so sorry about that. But I, I heard everything. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I I didn't say anything because we had a um, a public holiday, so national ho holiday on on Thursday, and then afterwards it dawned on me <laughs> that it was a Thursday. Um, but I would like to share my screen with you. Wait, where is it? No, it's not yet. Wait. Ah. Cannot. Yeah. yeah, I found it's better I'm, not I'm to so be in I found it's better not to be in full screen mode if when you want to share and when you want to get out of sharing. Yeah. yeah. It kind of, especially if you're using dual monitors cuz you're like where is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I just messed it up, obviously. Um, Are you looking for the screen? I, yeah, I just wanted to show you um, my, uh, my husband had a, had an, um, what do you say? An exposition, exposition, yeah. Um, with dance photos. And so we had an opening right around five o'clock when you met. And so he had um, two and a half to, to, to 80 meters on, on a um, truck plane. So it was really interesting. Wow. And we had a dance performance there. And so it was great. 
Oh, well, I didn't top. think of you af <laughs> only afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So was it on the truck, sort of? Um, no, no, it was like what you on the to protect them. Hmm. This is a foil, but something like that. So really, can it's more than canvas, and it's very strong, and so we had gigantic uh, photos Great. and I cannot uh, find out how to how to show them to you but uh, well hmm. so that's strange isn't there a place we'll uh, see. called share screen um. yes yes but I don't find my wait maybe I can can you see it now no no. No, okay. So, yeah. So, I'm sorry. Maybe maybe I can put one in the in the chat. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yes. So, so Carl, oh. good, good to see wait. you. So, wait. <coughs> maybe. Yeah. Maybe oh. now. Something's yeah. happening. Oh. Yeah, wow. Can you see? So. Absolutely. Yeah. So there were eight in one room. It's not a big one. It's, um, yeah. So. This. How do Is it? Look for the arrows. Is it gone? The... Is it no. stopping? Okay, no. So here we go. Right. Yeah, and today I was very busy with uh, uh, preparing a workshop for tomorrow. I have to go to Nuremberg <laughs> to to have a workshop, so I'm I'm pretty busy for that, and I'm preparing for Hungary for the integral European conference and I have to do that workshop in English. <laughs> so translation and things like that. Great. So wow. that's for me. And I don't know how long I'm, I can stay because uh, there's so much to do too. With looking what clothes to wear, <laughs> so I'm doing so much online or over the phone that I am always like, oh my god, what do I wear? Yep, I'm fine and I'm happy to see you and uh, to meet you, Andrew. It's great. So, Carl, uh, would you want to check in or? Yeah. Uh, really not too much to check in about. It's kind of, it's kind of needed some positive energy. So, it's been a rough week. Okay. Where are you, Carl? Uh, Alexandria, Virginia, about 10 miles south of D.C. Yeah. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll try to get some positive energy. I mean, it's, uh, um, I think it's often uh, like I get energy from, from having uh, these thoughts. So, um, yeah, I, I wonder what could be interesting. I mean, we, is there any, anything specific you, you want to talk about or, or some things you mentioned? Andrew about creating something as a way to unblock that that's a very interesting subject did did you check in Glenn for how you doing today maybe you did and I you went by quick I'm not sure yeah yeah I'm also kind of um, I often don't really know what to say in the beginning it's uh, kind of weird it takes me a little bit of time to to really get going but um, I mean I, I'm Basically, I've uh, been out 
in the sun most of the day, so now I'm finally back home. And um, um, and uh, generally speaking, um, my my interests these days is uh, a lot to do with uh, digital communication and uh, language, use of language, new ways of creating ideas. So so those are the kind of things I think about a lot. Uh, also do a fair bit of writing and. Uh, I've been writing a little bit in the last few days, and um, um, a lot what of, kind of what kind of a fair bit of what writing? Uh, writing, yes. You say yeah, block I, writing, or well, you used the word before writing? Um, no, I I think it's just um, just kind of essays, I guess. Uh, but well, blog writing, maybe blog writing, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a blog really, so, well, I guess I have kind of a medium, but I haven't been using it so much. But um, uh, often I'll write on Facebook if someone asks a question and then I try to give an answer and then the answer sort of grows and, and that, that's very often the way way the process works. So, so for me, the conversations is... Uh, it's a great inspiration to to generate ideas as well. So that's uh, that's also something um, we can do. You know, f from these conversations to, I mean, sometimes I'll just write something afterwards. Um, so I'm yeah really interested in, in that these days. And uh, but but I mean. Writing is one thing, but I mean, it's more for me. It's in one way, it's more interesting to have the the real conversations where using the voice. It uh, so I think it's. I'm also very interested in the interplay between um, yeah, written material and spoken material, and to, to kind of have a process where which can be generative and create something interesting kind of naturally so so many of those questions uh, i'm uh, quite interested in and uh, yeah so but um i'm feeling quite good today and uh yeah ready, ready to to go into something Are there any anything uh, any thoughts about what you guys want to talk about or some questions that would be a good starting point? Well, I'm I'm kind of right at the beginning of the summer term. I'm a second year doctoral student, and one of the courses is a practicum, so I'm supposed to actually be able to apply. <laughs> theory <laughs> and stuff so just trying to get pro just the general thing of trying to get projects started and kind of a little apprehensive I guess once I get a couple of once I get some traction then things will pick up but right now it's just I didn't get much have much success last term so as far as that was the praxis course and things so just kind of so that's kind of where I'm at right now so I guess I'm um, just kind of just uh, I guess um how you've gotten some successful projects going or whatever that kind of conversation would be helpful uh can you say a little bit more about that uh what do you mean by projects what kind of projects and what do you need so I've, um, with my organization, since I really can't apply the things, I'm actually looking at applying things to the university and things. So just getting, it's going to get people participating in events, you know, in meetings like this and 
and uh, it's part of it. So trying to, yeah, just try. I guess trying to find the right topic that'll kind of engage um, people. I guess part of it is a lot of irony too, because I'm actually looking at a lot at engagement theories. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm I'm having trouble getting and staying engaged myself. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. I guess it's not so easy to put those engagement theories into practice. Uh, and, uh, have you decided what you want to write your thesis about, or is that also what that, you're looking at and considering? Uh, that's still a way. Uh, that's still probably not till early next year for me, as far as um, I am. And part of it, I mean, the the capstone paper for the fall is kind of dependent on on these on some of these initiatives taking off and establishing communities so that's kind of so as i said it's kind of just getting that inertia going and going and things um i found some interesting um uh, references and things there's a a group they have a magic framework for employee engagement and that's about having meaning um autonomy uh, growth uh, impact and connection and stuff is there is their framework and, and things so, um, so yeah so it's just finding that finding a small group I mean you need to have a minimum of three like three people like so really like like the, this is kind of the minimum group so I could be taking some notes using some of the technology I want to be using and 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 not necessarily be participating in the conversation as much as kind of until I can and I need to it's kind of a catch-22 because I need to build some proficiency with the tool and stuff but if I don't get if I don't if I can't get the group started then I can't really and it's just uh, in theory kind of thing. yeah yeah right I would just like to to know. Um, I mean, I would I would be glad to to go with your uh, topic, uh, Carl. And at the same time, I would like to know um, what's on your mind, <laughs> Andrew. To, so be, before we dig deep in w one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm. I'm interested in how, in, in general, I'm, I'm, I, I'm interested in how I, as an individual, find a way to express what I need to say or be in a group. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by how in, in the world, in the social groups that I'm a part of, we tend or I tend to um, conform to what the group expects of me and to act like the group, the mainstream group wants me to, to be. So I'm interested in how we can use intentional groups to uh, put that problem of conformity into the middle somehow and see beyond that how can I say what is really true for me? Because knowing that we're all going to try and be, <clears throat> or, or my, my, my observation is that, uh, and I'll speak personally about it, a very strong need to belong and to have a good place within, within any circle. And here I'm with four people. I've met Glenn once before, but, but the, the others who I haven't met. So there's a strong need to kind of establish um, or to be um, both to satisfy my, my own need for expression and movement and being 
and also to satisfy the needs of the group for harmony, harmony and uh, safety and you know, coherence, I guess. So trying to acknowledge both of those things. And for me, an idea that I'm working with, and, I, and I, this may be, this may or may not be something you can use in some way, Carl, <coughs> or any, any of us, is um, to put the idea of, of the importance of belonging and safety and as something that we share, that in my view, uh, people, all people share strong need for that and put that in the middle and say, well, we have it. We have this hut. I wait for Heiner. Hello. Hello. Hello, Heiner. Where's Heiner? You're muted, Heiner. Do you want to unmute yourself, Heiner? And there. I'm I'm muted now. <laughs> Hi. And Andrew, could you? This is funny because you're just doing that right now. So it was your term, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Heine knows how to come yeah, in. Of course, of course. Hi. Yeah, just All right. Doing, yeah. So, shall I finish my idea there? Yeah. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. So I was, I was. Um, before I was so gently interrupted, uh, I was saying that that I'm interested in in the my need and what I think is a human need to belong in a social setting, to to, to belong and have a good place in a social setting, and I'm also interested in how I express myself with my unique one of a kind view beyond simply fitting into the group. So there's those two things. So it's navigating between belonging and individual expression, which I think is the core challenge for all of us humans. I think that's what, what I, and I'm interested in we spaces because they can highlight that um, navigation place, which is usually completely unconscious, and bring it to, to consciousness. Um, so that's what I'm kind of always thinking about that, and I'm I'm in the, I'm interested in how to create groups and community where we can explore that more, because I think that the 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 new uh, expressions that we need are on the other side of our need to belong. And usually we're playing our need to belong. Usually we're being nice. That's at least, that's my observation and certainly true for me. Usually I'm trying to uh, subtly, unconsciously fit in. So I, I inhibit my unique contribution. So I'm trying to find a way past that. So that's what's alive for me. Um, is that true right in the moment? Um, yeah, I'm telling you something that's that's uh, an active inquiry for for me. Um, try, you know, pointing at that phenomenon, and uh, I think it's at the core of building communities and um, um, and their possibilities. The possibility is of liberating our unique voices, which is what we really want to do our unique contributions so that's enough enough words thank you <laughs> yeah i know we we have done the the check-in which maybe you would like to do too a short one and at the moment we are at looking what topic is it that has the most juice <laughs> or wants to to be seen today and i was just wondering how much they um interrelate how the engagement 
is related to what uh, Andrew just said. And Heiner can check in if he wants to too. Oh, gone for now. He wants, but he, he's in and out often because his internet connection is not so. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I guess there's, there's an interesting relation between uh, belonging, uh, feeling of belonging and engagement. What kind of engagement uh, sort of, yeah, this balancing, I guess, or of, of expectations or, or something to, to fit into, but then to add something new. Uh, that's uh, that, that's an interesting balance. Figure, figure that out. Um, so one thing, uh, I, I guess that if um, well, if I have something unique to offer, then um, then maybe maybe it's a sign of a, a good group or a good setting or possibly engaging setting. If if that would work to to express clearly, perhaps. But but I guess uh, it's. Um, yeah, it's something about sort of the, the culture, if, if there's a culture of openness, which is uh, inherent to the setting, I guess that, uh, that also might be important to, to sort of have that space for, for just uh, expressing something. And, and also like, if there's a generative conversation uh, that we want to have, we want to get to something new, then I guess by its very nature, we will have to sort of go in the deep end, so to say, or, 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 or well, it's like, it, let's say that you want to formulate uh, an idea that you just haven't really formulated before, then the first few times, I mean, we would expect it to be, uh, maybe difficult to understand it or so that, that also seems relevant I guess that's why uh, that's why uh, often it's good when it's also this playful attitude where uh, where I guess the part of the thing is to experiment and uh, and be, be able to test something out. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but this belonging, I mean, yeah, that, that, that really seems to be at the core of all this. Hmm. Carl, how, how, how does that resonate with you, what Andrew said, with your topic, with your, I mean, you're starting you're starting your second we would call it semester or second whatever <laughs> in the summer uh, and and for me it 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 felt like it has some weight to it would you just would you share it and um I think, or something that that Andrew shared could relate to that, and it is more a general, <laughs> general topic, and yours is more present and more like burning, or maybe just not burning <laughs> because the engagement is not so. Um, so, what do you? I, I would just know. For for me, it's both is fine, and I don't have a topic. I I, I have been to a, a session on Saturday, and I'm really this week was really dense with uh, unblocking, and so I'm kind of for me it's 
both is fine. And if Heine has something to, <laughs> to add, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If um, Heiner wants to check in, and then I can um, respond. Now we have him Heiner. twice. Two <laughs> Heiners. Uh, Heiner, I think you're you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, I'm having a lot of bandwidth and technical problems. I do not mean to interrupt you. <laughs> you're good, Heiner. We're good. Good to see you. Yes, it takes up a lot of bandwidth to, to have this. Um, sometimes it just jumps in and out, but uh, that's just the way it is. So, Heine, do you want to add something to our conversation, checking in and uh, saying if you have a subject to to dig deeper deeper <laughs> or that you just want to go along with what's here already i think it is better that i tune in a little bit mm -hmm. i always learned to whom is it addressed when you say something so what i heard from andrew that he was looking into his position or the identity or I, I, I did not get much from what Andrew said but it sounded well in my field of interest so I resonated but I better listen anyway as the bandwidth might be fading again it's much better to follow you follow your lines or, or Heiner you can just say a few words about how you're doing today and maybe that will fit in anyway It'll just be part of our conversation. A creative mix in. Well, I'm in Berlin. I think beside Andrew, we have met before. I did very little today. Write a few emails, send some birthday wishes, uh, prepared for next week. We're doing a major uh, used for planning a festival around Pentecost, south of Berlin, with a couple of hundred young people. So I had to arrange my travels and a few other things. And anyway, I suddenly looked at the watch and I realized, oh, there might be a conversation with you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same time on Sundays and Thursdays. So, uh, um, yeah. So, Kai. <laughs> Your thoughts? So, the, um, oops. Um, yeah, part of the, um, I guess I was saying the trying to get groups started and uh, and things. So I guess I could actually demo the one tool a little bit, and that would actually the topics I've been capturing that can get that can help get Heiner up to speed on the conversation so far. So um, may I first ask one or two questions to understand the on the meta, not the tool itself. Um, so when you say uh, group starting, and I need at least three, is that an ongoing group? Is is that an, like, would you like to recruit somebody here? <laughs> or whatever that might mean. What kind of people do you need? And, yeah, and then talk about the the your your yeah. background. Yeah, I guess it's um, well. There'd be different there'd be different um, things to look at, and like most communities, you end up usually getting a small 
core group of people who are really who really are um so i like um we've had we have a group i don't there's but um 580 people that have joined the facebook group but there's really on there's been about um probably eight to ten of us that have been showing up on like have been here like for at least five of the calls and then there's some people that will show up occasionally and then um, we do have uh new people come in like andrew and he may become a regular or might it all depends on things but i guess to get um so it, there can be some um um variability there it's just it is kind of at least three um at least two people i guess three but i mean uh, there needs to be a conversation going where i'm not having to be the active active in the conversation as much so i i certainly can't do it one-on-one -on -one, at least for for um capturing the tool in real time but then like i've been doing so far here i've been adding i've been adding some things to the um one tool as as people have been talking and it's all it's there could be a group out of here that um it's because it, it's a way to manage content so there could be a group that want to kind of use help use this tool to curate the the content that's getting generated out of our group conversations so that's that's one of the things so there's several tools that I've been looking at, I think the visual tend to be the the ones that are more engaging and things. So I've got several tools that are very visual in um, nature and things to show. Okay, so tools to present ideas in, in conversations or? Uh, uh, yeah, the, um, the, this, the one the tool that i'm looking at today is one that's basically like a dynamic mind mapping tool and then there's other tools that are kind of designed i think um, the structuring yeah. capturing the structure of the of the thing and like i um going through and what are questions and ideas and pros and cons and stuff. So um, that's a tool that's actually been developed by a friend, a mutual friend of mine with um, Sam and a, a number of other people. And then, um, and that's one that I'm, I think will really take off at school because the, the um, on one hand, like I'm do, I've been doing here, it's individual sense making, but then you could potentially get into uh, use, using it to, uh, to help facilitate meetings too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that they, it's, uh, it's a growth process, right? That uh, you get, generate new, new ideas. And because these conversations, uh, there's been quite a few already, so it's uh, already a large archive of written content from the automatic transcripts, and so we're, we've actually been talking quite a bit about that. What what would be the best way to, to sort of harvest the, all, all the data which comes out of the the conversations? So so do, so you. You, have you sort of programmed tool for doing that kind of harvesting? Is it those kind of things or? Yeah, some, somewhat. Yeah, there's basically there's so many different tools that that people. I mean, we have some incredible expertise with various um, platforms, as well as for a lot of them are the people who've been creating the the um, platforms, like. Uh, um, some of the people that were on last week, um, Jack Park has a whole um, platform he's developing um, and things among others. So that's, and various tool, various platforms will have different strengths. So it might 
make sense for some for some content to be captured in one and, and they kind of all kind of augment each other. I don't, I just see, I see the, all those different groups being um, kind of forming. So, I mean, we could have a, we could have some conversations about how can you really be effective with Zoom and things, particularly if we, and we need to get better at that because right now we've, I don't think we've had more than, than seven or eight, maybe one time we got up to 10 because it actually did it um zoom goes up to like a three by three brady bunch <laughs> um window if you're familiar with that old show and then then it um it can go all the way up to 25 and then you start getting screens worth of things so how do you the whole facilitation things i mean can it you start getting to more than 10 people how can people even get a word in edgewise stuff so there's all kinds of ways to facilitate and maybe you have to break up into the subgroups and then the subgroups report back out to the general i mean there's so many of those there's so many different um, facilitation methods so that's actually one of the areas i'm really looking at because i'm i'm looking at how can people really be um be engaging and and um and all the different con all the different conversations, what, like people are really trying to solve problems or you just want to do brainstorming or do you want to almost just have a support group or whatever it is um, and things, but those are all. Yeah, purpose about the conversation. Hal, I, I do have an, an, a second question. What do you need or with which ear I should listen? because i i'm 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 just how can we support you best that's that's my way and i i always have andrew in my <laughs> ear as well but um what is it that you need uh you don't have to tell us everything <laughs> about but what is it that could make a difference today and unblock you with your your engagement just uh I can actually share my screen real briefly just to give you a, a, a visual of what I'm talking about with this particular tool. Ah. So these are the topics we've been talking about uh, before, and then there seem to be some real consensus around belonging and then like with belonging i can actually i can have custom searches so this is search this will search my uh, my university library i don't know let's see that's actually going to be showing up on the other screen so i'll have to pull it up No, we don't see what's on the right side because of our pictures. You can move all of those easily, uh, Gertrude. Just okay. Click and move them. Mm -hmm. right there. Oh, yes. great. So then these are all um, things I can be uh, I can be looking at. So the, all these you can see all these different areas. Um, It's it's interesting sometimes too because I'll uh, I'm not even putting a filter in, but I'll have. It seems like there's almost a built-in filter. Like one time everything was from Finland, and then another time everything seems to be about about like healthcare or something. And I didn't even I didn't even um, that. But yeah, as I said, so this is I'm going back to the the tool and stuff, then that's, if there was any thing there, I could just drag, drag and drop it onto here and it would um, form, form a thought. Now they, these are called thoughts or nodes. And then you have, um, you have a parent um, jump thought and these, then these end up kind of being sibling thoughts because they share the parent. 
And their sibling thoughts to belonging. Correct. Yeah. So now. Okay. And and by the way, uh, Andrew, yes, uh, GCC is the the global co um, challenge collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. I. I it's, my question wasn't very clear before, Gertrude. I actually was wondering whether just whether Carl was talking about GCC when, yeah. or, or something at university. But yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. GCC, yeah. Yeah, so my thought was that I would just, I would, I created the separate one that's dedicated to the group here, and then it's whenever, whenever I participate, I'm just capturing um, some things, and then there's actually a, a team environment where where people could be co, like co curating the environment. Um, and things but just rather than um just having it go you know just i like well my personal one i've got i've got I'm getting close to four thousand thoughts and there's a guy jerry mccloskey who's part of the group too and he's been using one tool he doesn't get into all the the features and things but he's been had he's had one file for 20 years now and it's just like hundreds of thousands of thoughts <laughs> And stuff all in one, all in one file. But um, one of the powerful things this has over some of the other ones is you can actually just switch. So this kind of this goes into an outline view, and you can uh, so it force it gets you out of lateral thinking right into to um, hierarchical thinking, just by switching that, and then the. This is a new version, so I'm still, I've got a learning curve with it some too, but then the, then they have a my, more traditional mind map kind of mode too. So if, if we wanted to pick, like we, if we wanted to um, decide, like I mean, we already kind of talked about belonging as one of the things. And then, um, well, you can see I, uh, uh, I made a connection between. Um, oh, gotta get back out of. Yeah, switch. belonging and engagement. Uh, right. So belonging and engagement, um, then identity and group cohesion, mm -hmm. and um, and so it's it, there's so many different patterns too. Like you can kind of see these three are are. Uh, so there's almost there can almost be a very the structure of things is is pretty interesting then because uh, then you got the connections that I've made are are um, these jump thoughts and things. Yeah. Um, it's like a little similar to the brain. Yeah, this is the this is the brain software. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but it's a new, they just came out with a version 9, so if you haven't looked at it, it looks quite different. And I guess with, guess with that, I'll stop sharing. So that's kind of the idea is that other people, as they get, they get um, people who are just starting out with the brain, they could be doing what I was doing, capturing some thoughts in the background, and then they can share their screen for a little while and and uh, and then people can give feedback about how they're structuring things or all kinds of um things or if other people bring up things and then any any references you want to bring up about belonging and things like peter block has the book community the structure of belonging is um and i've actually got some, over my Brian, I actually been looking at some of that. So those are things I can add after the fact. Um, or if I pulled it, uh, pulled it up, I could potentially add things into the chat um, session here too. But then you got the balance between all this and then, our, then staying engaged in the conversation that's happening at the time too. Yeah. So that's the balance you, you're st kind of struggling with. Because my mind's always in chatter mode. I don't. It's like I make. I'm making connections. Like, oh yeah, that's like Peter Block's book and various things. So, 
Heiner. Heiner? Ka Karl, um, I have a question. So you're finding a few words and you are online linking to Fieldings University uh, with all their repositories, with all the databases. I saw that you linked to Taylor and Francis, which is typically a journal or a book. Is it online for you available? Are there, yes. no, are there no paywalls? Um, no, for, um, for my, for the universe, university, we have access to over 4,200 journals. So that's a very privileged uh, situation. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm paying $2,300 a month for it <laughs> too, with tuition. So. Well, that's also very privileged that you can do that. Yeah, exactly. We we were very concerned, I think it, it was in the early 90s, when we uh, spoke about magnetic portals. So when the internet was coming, that there are like through gravity, information into going this environment and that environment. And this environment can be all English speaking people or French speaking or Chinese speaking people. So what you're doing here is fantastic and it helps you to navigate between various terms. But I wonder how other cultures have access and what they understand by, by belonging or identity. Because this is very, very culture sensitive and situation specific. So I wonder are we playing here some kindergarten or is this really helping us to come together? I was hoping to have some here next weekend, but it's postponed. But you seem to be also on the level. What you're doing here is very much hierarchical semantic networks, uh, network navigation but not going into fields of meanings and a spectrum of meaning. Well, this is um, any one of the, in a conversation, then we could pick any one of those topics and then really delve into it. I mean, it all, it kind of depends on the context and my, my thoughts are there are some people, well, we've got some people who are already using the brain or are interested in it, and that could kind of form a community of practice. And then we could potentially give a pres we could potentially record a presentation about some aspect of things, and that post that. And different tools are going to resonate with different people and things. So that's part of it. I, I don't want to paint play any favorites, but you know, I've been using the tool for almost 20 years and, um, and things. So, and now the new, and when you come out, like got in this new, ver the brain nine has got many chain. It's like many changes to it. So I've got a learning curve myself, um, and things, but, um, so that's kind of the idea I have is that we, and then, um, It'll be interesting to look at. I haven't really looked at the at some of the auto transcript type of stuff. This is a very, this is still a very um, uh, in, uh, man, individual tool and stuff. It's not. There's not a lot of automation behind it. It's more about. It's geared to help people develop their sense making, and then you can start getting into this. They have a team brain thing then. So that's that's where. And I can provide, um, the software does cost money and it does have a, a client version, but I can provide, uh, I can provide some um, support so it wouldn't cost people anything. Mm -hmm. And the brain is uh, purely and only in English? Um, I think it can be. I think it can be other tools. That's, that really gets into the operating system and things and i think it has yeah different language different 
of alphabets that it can support too. I don't know if anybody, I don't know anybody who's using it that way, but I can certainly do some checking on that with um, the, the, um, the, the, the company. Uh, no, Doug uses uh, the brain a lot, and uh, I, I used to before, it's really great software, so, but it, I guess it's like you say that it's a little bit expensive, some people think, but uh, right. it's... Uh, Right. Yeah. And then like, then there, this other tool, the, the software is called compendium and it's uh, open source, no cost software. Uh, but then also with when things are no cost and there's no, there can be like no support for development and stuff. So it's still using like Java seven. So it needs to, if I hit the lottery, then I, that was one of the things I would I would fund that project. But you know, you got to find you got to find some investors for some of the things. So there's the trade-offs on things. So I can't use the tool that tool at work because the the Java seven just can't be supported anymore. Some things I'm sure other people are in that situation. So and who developed it? I didn't uh, get that. There's a group, um, yeah, Jeff Conklin, uh, and there's a um, Cognexus group. He, um, it kind of started, and what I, I use it as an example because the um, software was actually, um, the, um, the software was developed to enable the, the, the method and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's that most things are the other way around. We have to, we have to, um, we have to limit our methodologies to the capabilities of the technology way too, way too often. Um, mm. And then there's a group called the Compendium Institute that was formed out of the Open University UK. Uh, Simon Buckingham Shum was the um, director there. He's actually moved to Australia more recently, so I haven't touched base. I haven't talked with him in <coughs> quite a while. Um, actually, but that's, that's the group then that's kind of, so it's, and uh, then it's similar, um, like, um, well, with Jack's parks work and stuff, that's very visual with mapping and things too. There's debate graph, which I've seen some people using here, uh, too. So there's different tools and things. So that's, that's part of it is people getting aware of what the tools are out there and then what, oh, you know, which ones resonate with them. Yeah, we've used, uh, we've used to chat a little bit here, but uh, I guess it's like you say, it's a bit of a trade off because, uh, I mean, it takes a bit of attention to do the writing, but then some people like it. So it's good for their thinking to just so take some notes. I'll just jump in for a sec, uh, guys. At uh, some, uh, I'm feeling a little far back. Far back here. Uh, I'll sh I hope this is. Oh, I'll just say, for me, I come. F I come from a very non-scientific background. And very and I struggle with the analytical part. So when I look at the belonging software, with all respect, it just does not resonate with me. I, I just I see I would not it would not be something that would, would grab me and it has its value, but it's not for me. So just kind of reflecting that part of life. And a, just a an analogy that came is um, for example, if I was to put all of Rumi's poetry and put and feed it into the 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 brain uh, software, and you know, made all of the linkages between. My fear would be that, that we would lose the poetry in it, and we would, and all of the good stuff feels to me like it's between the words and between the terminology. So to share to to have all of the uh, the all of its connected um, with all of the different thoughts and their interconnections. 
I would fear losing the poetry. So I would just rather go directly for the poetry and, 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 and leave the rest. But that would be my style. And I'm, I know there's values in both because, you know, we made this fabulous internet and all this stuff. And we didn't do that by poetry. We did it by <laughs> something really practical. Um, but that would be, so, so for me, I just cannot imagine my brain would, would, would rebel. I couldn't even finish doing the, the Myers-Briggs where it tries to categorize uh, me into Myers-Briggs. Three times I tried it and I just threw my pen down and said, I'm not doing that. But that's just me. So out of that perspective. Mm -hmm. That's maybe why we some some have talked about what kind of software would be best and would maybe have something that could be sort of automatically working in the background and not demanding a lot of time and attention so that we could sort of say focus on the poetry uh, and uh, sort of have the automated systems to create uh, a written account. And, uh, I, I Aina, can you works. mute? Yeah. Yes, I have much problems. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, it was a little uh, background noise here, so it might have been from from here. But, but yeah, I know what you're saying there. That uh, sort of to just focus too much on the written things, uh, somehow it takes the attention away from the, I guess, the movement or the uh, energy exchange. I have another. My brain <laughs> needs something else. Um, so I, I want to have the context and I want to have this, the, the question I tried the last one. Um, like for example, in which um, institute or what um, subject your studies have or your is it in sociology? Is it in IT science? Is it where is it located? So I I know where you're coming from, um, and you started out with engagement, and I um, we are talking about many different um, tools, techniques, whatever we can use, and. For me, those are means to an end, or they are tools to reach something that my intention is. So it might be useful for this, but not useful for another one. And and for me, it's it's like, what is your intention? What is the greater frame in which you're talking from where you come? And so for me, this is a lot of, there are many, many things, many thoughts, and, but I don't know where to put them or what to use it for. And, and I would like to know what is it that you are coming from um, so it makes it's not that it doesn't make sense but but for me it's too too like flurry to to, to really know how to support you yeah i get it. good question like maybe purpose is another good yeah. word like uh, yeah. but that would be interesting to, to hear some more, more about um, sort of larger purpose of of the system yeah and from which signs do you come from yeah yeah so it's um it's an organization development and change program and then i'm in a, a media technology and innovation concentration which is uh which is going to be a total 12 credit hours in uh, um, advanced systems um uh, creativity and innovation and org design are two of the courses that I'll be taking this year. I'm taking the advanced systems course now. 
um, and things. So I can, um, yeah, let me just, So then this is the this is the um, page about that this concentration here um, and things so there's yeah that, that's one of the things too is like um, we've seemed to have some difficulty with actually showing a video um, during um, a video during the zoom that's one of the things you need to practice and get better at to be more effective with that but um but, but yeah, also uh, and then um i'm also a huge proponent i want to actually try to get people meeting in person but that's that's very difficult i have two meetup groups that i'm um, trying to start so one of them is happening hours and that's basically just be engaging people at whatever restaurant or bar there are at almost and doing some networking so people trying to get a small group of people like wherever um, people talking to each other and then identifying an awesome thing they want to make happen and then i have my other the awesome things is my second meetup which would be more about um, potentially bringing in a guest speaker or um just or actually trying to get into how would how do you how do you people get success and started or get unstuck in their efforts to be change agents. So that's kind of a thing, but it's like <laughs> trying to get people to show up. I was telling my dad about this and it's like my first meetup group, it was my having a beer by myself. So you can't get much more humble beginnings than that. I appreciated very much the question of Gertrude because if you don't know from where you have no idea on where to and and i feel we're doing interesting things here with the zoom software but the central questions what are our data what is our context do we include andrew mentioned harmony some poetry how do we link to the meaning and and my experience and I was in artificial intelligence research in one of the big institutes in the early 90s, is that we failed much with this artificial languages like Lisp, and now we do a lot with big data. And for me, the problem is big data, big noise. We think we know, but we don't, and we get into trouble. And this is what I see what Carl is doing. It is alphanumeric. It is just what can be put into some character strings with words and with numbers. Okay, then they have some translators. But the translators, if you see one word, how many meaning that has, and how many um, overtones, undertones, harmonical um, interferences and levels and fields can be involved. It is very, very dangerous that we think we know, but don't, Mark Twain said. So I was asking about the roots of the repositories you used, because there have been environments where the United Nations or the predecessor organizations, the Union of International Associations, was building up such public repositories and they've been building it up and switching between different languages and that was somehow stopped. So it was somehow public, then it got lost, but these people looked into the interlinkages and, and went much deeper and this is what we did with our systems encyclopedias, taking words and their meanings, and then see how many meanings are behind one word. This is very practical in, in, in peacemaking, in multi-track diplomacy and peacemaking, as we say. And there I'm struggling. I'm here because I like Zoom. 
have really come to an end of the potentials because scaling up maybe more than 25 people would be a good group, especially if you want to go from liquid to living democracy. Anyway, I don't want to talk so much. I always love to bump in here and to meet new people like Andrew, but I feel I have to leave very soon. And the moment Sam arrives here in Berlin very soon, I will let you know and see if our data and, and feelings and senses and whatever worlds can come together or not. He's a computer egghead, like some others, but we have to also make our living and our buck. So I feel how with this brain or what compendium or whatever software they can help in a broader community or a smaller community. Right, yeah. Um, both Sam and I are one, of our, one of our primary inspirations. He was all about the computers, a tool to augment our intellectual capabilities to resolve challenges. That's that's um, type of thing. So that's that's all part of that's all part of um, what I've been been working on. Um, just one last thing to. Um, See. Yeah, like well, with with the brain software, then you can you can be having the mind map, but then each thought can have a can have attachments, and you can see the website that it's linked to, and then you can even yeah, you can expand out so. If you want to just take notes, you can be doing that and not get lost in all the um, yeah, so there's and um and then, as you said, I mean I, I'm a huge proponent of meeting in person so i'd like um there's i don't know if they've picked where if they've picked a new location because the one place closed but on sunday evenings they had um they had poetry this little coffee shop had poetry readings on sunday evenings and stuff so as i said i mean getting people to to hear a really great person being able to recite uh, love poem from Rumi. that's that's what we want to get to and find the people who would that resonates and then, you know, have them. That's what's the power of the, this meetup.com platform has so much potent, there's so much um, latency in that, but I mean, that's how we need to get going again. I mean, newspapers and our whole politics, it all started drink um, <laughs> with our, like, um, with people having beer, <laughs> having beers in public houses, that's how. <laughs> And so a lot of social changes happen. So we're having meet up online here, meet up online, uh, any number of conversations that can move us forward. Yeah, I have a friend from Switzerland, and he says, like, when the technology is working, it uh, it's like our event, our events are like trees, and then the technology can be the hammock connecting the trees. It was kind of the, but yeah. So that that's the challenge: is how do you how do you engage people? Yeah, like I've been, you know, to, how do you get people to meet in in person anymore? Um, and then, and I think part of it's meeting people wherever they are, and then what then engaging. So that's the part of it. So I was I was just wondering if saying or thinking that only meeting in person supports really in, real engagement if that is a belief sentence that um hinders like i i'm working since 14 i would say i've done most of my stuff online or via telephone 
we are working for 90% of our time in telephone coaching, um, trainings in groups. And I couldn't do my work if I had that belief sentence. So I love to see people. I love to hug them and I love to uh, drink a wine. I'd rather drink wine than beer. Um, this is <laughs> not that I don't like that. <laughs> uh, but this potential of being engaged online, like uh, doing the Reinventing Organizations Wiki, we, were, we had done the, the um, um, Ken Wilber group. And then I heard about it and we were about 30 people. Meanwhile, there are 2000 and, and they were just 30 people saying, okay, within a month, we have that book translate, uh, transferred to a wiki and we did it. And everybody took one part and wrote it. And then we edited and proofread and all this. And we had, the best time together and for me this is not not but it would have been better to to sit next to each other i i i, I doubt so sorry but uh this was like ringing bells for me yeah. no, uh, that's, no that's definitely i mean we have to have the mix of both i mean i worry that the people who are teenagers now are never going to meet in person. <laughs> it's like they, they sit across the, like we were joking one time at the stoplight, yeah. uh, the two people texting. It's like, are they texting each other? <laughs> but, um, it's exciting what you're doing, Heiner, next week. Uh, a, a bunch of young people coming together south of Berlin. Sounds exciting. Uh, that sounds fabulous. Yeah. Heine, do you know uh, Julia Marcy? Yes. And will she be with you there? No. Um, it is uh, called Makers for Humanity. And I will send uh, in the chat box the m4h.club URL. Say it again. Or can you put it in the, in the chat? It's already done. Oh. Uh, I'm for ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now you see, we have this, since 20 years uh, a youth group, and we did work a lot around the Expo 2000 of bringing the youth of the world together, looking into new developments. So I had the opportunity to look very early into such things like systems. So we did the Hulne seminar and I included, I included Ken Wilber and the Quadrons in, I think, early or mid 90s. And we look, looked into Hulne and systems and ceilings. So maybe I'm very arrogant having other concerns now. But one of these concerns is I totally believe um, the Gatroud that it is great to collaborate to collaborate by telephone or by video conferencing and I'm a big fan about it but the real problem start when we don't have a deep conversation when war is happening and fighting when people have the same words but other meanings yeah and even there we do um, with concepts taking up uh, the American Indians and the Maori conflict resolution uh, situations where the communities of stakeholders look into the deep drivers. How are the issues related? And this goes into the theory of democracy. Do we vote for priorities or for influences? And influences can be voted uh, in a group and then you can come to deep drivers. And our experience is, and I'm speaking from experiences in real uh, conflict zones like uh, Cyprus or Colombia or whatever you want, that 
this needs to have informed decisions and that goes much more than just having a word and a context. And we were just three weeks ago with the president of the, I think, International Open Knowledge Society or whoever. And he said, yes, we now collect all the data, but we, we forgot about the structure. And data without, without structure, like values out of, without structure, are meaningless. And what we are building us is a gigantic uh, repository with some guys guarding it. We have the problems of the um, deleters in Wikipedia. So there was a clash at the beginning of Wikipedia, Citizenium and, uh, and uh, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia. So it's the development chief and uh, the guy who took up the idea of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, to really see if it can be done by all the people or when, who is pushing one out and who is controlling what is finally in if others have interest that certain names, certain celebrities, certain brands are in such an open public Wikipedia environment. So I look very much into not just the um, semantic web, which is just alphanumeric, but really go get, get into the feelings, the senses, the colors, and all this important information to go beyond linear thinking or box thinking that we, that's why we liked Canova and his quadrants, but it's still management technologies putting into four boxes or a square or a quad, quadrant system. And I think human life is much more complex and especially peacemaking. Anyway, uh, we are on the right way, Gertrude, and uh, the meeting go to Makers for Humanity, and um, maybe you enjoy it. We are building recycling rafts and islands since 20 years, and I'm one, one of the old guys. So I'm the pilot, not the captain. Yay, Heiner, I'm looking forward to looking to, I'm seeing it already and I'm looking forward to playing with that. I just want to say one quick, quick word for me that uh, a connection I hadn't quite made before and a few, Gertrude and Heiner both have mentioned context and I, I often think of context, but actually context is a good simple word for what I mean by belonging because it's the actual sense of context in the moment. It's belonging is our sense of being in a context that makes sense to us. And then we can add our creative, our creative input into that. But that's really what I mean by belonging. So I really, I love that simplification. Thank you. Joshua, short bearded one. Welcome. Yeah, good to see you, Josh. Hi. Just to keep you up to speed, we've, uh, we've been talking a little bit about group uh, and group engagement and uh, sort of um, uh, how, well, how we can understand that, uh, what is behind engagement and interest and showing up and keep coming back. And uh, we've also talked about data and uh, it's a very, very interesting point that often comes up actually is this uh, sort of, um, well, the, the, the data or, or written languages, it kind of comes alive when we attend to it. it it's almost like that. And I guess it's the same with, with even the te technological platforms that, well, we have the technology, uh, but then we have the process uh, where we use the technology. And that is the context within which the technology is used. So it seems to be a, uh, always a two-way relationship between uh, the, the people and the pe and the programs people use 
and uh, so uh, I mean so sometimes for example I, I even wonder whether you know email if I if I really understand what email really means based on how I've been using it in the past maybe there might be totally different ways to using it which just has haven't been considered so uh, but, but still that doesn't mean that the platform itself isn't important of course but it's, it's just that somehow it's always about the, the relationship between how we are in our being and activity and consciousness and all that and then how we interact with the with the program so so we, we've been looking at a little of those kind of questions so how are you doing josh uh, before you you speak josh uh Heine said he might go soon so i so would like to thank you <laughs> for your input and um say hello to sam just give him a group hug and uh it's great to to know how how you are doing together and and to get some sharing from your conference yeah, yeah. i have to go i have to go also maybe you have to say something right here but i'll just say thank you very much i've got something actually important for me today a really good connection with that context belonging and the four quad quadrants how they fit into that really helps me to simplify that um so thank you, and it's been fun. And great to meet you all, Joshua. I look hope to see you again. I won't start a whole new thing with you here. Yep. No, just say love, Carl. Best wishes, and I'll see you again. Gwen, thank you for great hosting. entry. Yeah, take care. Take care. And I thought, yeah, well, for me, there is a connection between uh, engagement and belonging. So if you don't feel safe enough, if you don't feel uh, wanted, uh, why should you engage? <laughs> so, sorry, Andrea is gone, but I need to say that. So, yes, so, sorry. <laughs> I just had. No, no, I was just going to say thank you for hosting. Thank you for, I, I saw the message to someone to host, and uh, it's Mother's Day here in America, so I was just spending time with my mom. And then I looked at the time and then I said, oh, maybe I can make it. So I came in and I'm so happy that some people are here. And Heiner, good to catch you at the end. Good to see you at the end. And Carl and Glenn, thanks for catching me up. I just wanted to say thank you for letting me pop in at the end. So happy yeah. Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Is that in different days in different countries, right? Maybe uh, Mother's Day is in different countries. Uh, or is it all over the world? I don't know. In Germany, it is. Yeah, my my girls reminded me. It is today, Gertrude, in Germany. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'll have to call my mother and um, after. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Norway says. Yeah. But anyway. I a few thoughts that come to my mind on what we've been talking about is um, it's yeah engagement belonging that feeling of, of safety but I mean my experience has been that with all groups coming together there's some kind of defined purpose which uh, is always in the background and uh, it seems that the way that that's been defined seems to always influence subtly uh, the kinds of conversations that happen. And, uh, uh, and, and with, with this GCC, for example, it's called the Global Challenges Collaboration. So it's sort of in the word that it's a collaboration about global challenges. Uh, of course, it, the challenge with that is that it's a very, very big, vague mission. So, so one idea we've been kind of testing out i guess is, is to to try to use the process to uh, get to know more about each person's purpose and then by adding all the the purposes together uh, that might be the 
the larger purpose, which uh, which can then, after a while, be defined. So, of course, some some people feel that's a little bit vague because you because you sort of um, don't want to commit to one definition of a purpose early on, um, but 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 it does have the advantage that uh, when you know when the individual purposes have been made clear, then the larger purpose can sort of naturally come about by itself. And uh, I've seen there's a few typical questions that that keep coming back in these kind of talks, and that that's also very interesting to to notice. But but one thing you said, Carl, was yeah. that you you were sort of not so active. Is it an important part of uh, your thing that that you sort of have an observer role? Uh, what was that? To so that you said something about that. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. actually kind of both with the academic side of things. There's the mean being to be this neutral out outside observer and then there's the whole participatory action research too which which in, um, interests me really that's yeah in fact the one book I was looking at they they talk about the traditional research approach as research on and then they're talking about um, cooperative inquiry which is research with and then my my thoughts because another mentor of mine is all about purpose is is there a is there another level of, of research for uh, research for where you, people are really bonding through that shared purpose? I think we are coming here to a very central question: Am I an actor or am I an observer? And I always learned English people say, "How big is your umbrella?" And this is the question, and, and our group evolved out of the work with Fleming Funch, just doing experiments, because uh, these foundations had a competition on the global challenges, and this is how this group evolved, because we thought we really have a big challenge, which is intersectorial, it's local, it's global, it's intercultural, and whatever. So we all assembled here with many interesting tech freaks. And we really learned that some have some really interesting bullets or great solutions or ideas or dreams. And some are really content providers, but others are vanities. But we did not really check the frame of our identity and our endeavor or assumptions. And I always remember the statement when all these big thinkers, maybe 60 or 80 years ago, assembled, trying to develop general thinking. And they were looking into history, culture, peace, uh, any, any subject. It was in Asilomar in California, and some of the um, professors from Stanford bumped in and said, what are you so heatedly discussing here about? And they said, well, it's about everything. Ethics, peace, freedom, uh, whatever. And, and he shook his hand and he said, that's not my field, and he ran out. And our group, I think, here has the same challenges. We realized this is a really gargantuan, gigantic task we are tackling here. And we are coming all with our worm's eye, with our isolated thing, and trying to, to solve the problem in view of the tools we have. And it's very fashionable to have these new tools, like they had telephone 100 years ago, or they have uh, internet now 10 or 20 years ago. But we really don't know. So the original question from Gatproud a moment ago, what is it about? Is it just semantic web? 
or what the other guy who just left said, how about the harmony and, and the content and, and the senses of poetry? How can we include that? Because data alone, as I mentioned before, are meaningless. And we are just fighting because someone has access and the other has not access because he maybe he doesn't speak English. Anyway, I was talking too long. Well, that seems that seems very very relevant. Uh, yeah, because it's it is such a big challenge. Uh, I mean, uh, so I guess one question that comes is uh, what it actually means to do general thinking, because at, at least that seems that everyone here is. Uh, in these talks, have a clear idea that there's just this one gigantic uh, scenario where, where everything is influencing everything else somehow, and and, and it, it can't really be can't really be broken down into any sub disciplines, and uh, somehow the the tools for this kind of general situational and at the same time. Um, problem solving uh, mindset or, or activist mindset then maybe these tools seem to well i guess maybe we will have to develop them because it's not so it's not so clear where to go at least in academic thinking it doesn't really seem to to be all that much i mean the uh, general thinking so to say uh, and that is something which is on my mind a lot too. Like, is there a way that we can uh, really organize thoughts situationally about the the larger scenario, uh, and and actually in a way where where that activity participates in the larger scenario and has a, a beneficial effect. That seems like one of those core questions that we've been circling around a lot in these talks too. Uh, and, and the differences in meaning that you mentioned, Heiner, that also seems like a big challenge in itself that uh, people assign different meanings to the same words and, and often we don't even know it. So until a lot later, perhaps. I'm I'm just thinking of you say breakdown in in smaller segments. This is not how how I perceive it. It's more like there is this big picture I cannot see it as a whole, and then I have a, magn a magnificent magnifying glass, and I go o hover over it or stay at a specific thing and then look deeper. But most, many people, or me as well, just get lost into that, that magnifying glass thing and, and think that is the whole. And, and so it, it's good to take that away once in a while and <laughs> just have a bigger glance at it. Um, and, and there is something like, how I see the world, if I take it, that's how the world is, <laughs> then I'm in trouble. But if I can just say, okay, that's how I perceive it, how, how I can see it, and I can realize that there are so many others, gazillion other ways to look at the same thing. Um, that I don't take myself too um, too much of knowing the truth, <laughs> and and just without um, yeah being humble of how the world is, and I think that that's that supports not having a stand and then fighting for that. With somebody else who who has another meaning to the same thing. 
So giving up being right, even if I know I am, <laughs> that might open doors. Um, this is one part. And the other, I, I was thinking of Ellie Drake, who, who says we, we have three different purposes. We have our personal purpose uh, that is really like what I am here for and what my personal things are. And then I have a professional purpose, like how do I make my living? What is that for? And a global purpose. This is, it's more like the, the meaning beyond my personal thing. And most people, they intermingle those, especially the global and the professional. Um, and, and, Yeah, they, it's, it's like going from my little me to a, a, a little bit bigger and then the, the, the biggest. And, and if we don't distinguish that, she says it's a problem. And that purpose is a river, not a goal. This is something that is changing over time. There is something that is kind of eternal, but it's, it's ever changing. So maybe we don't have to focus on purpose as something, okay, we have to define it and then it's forever, but something that, that evolves over time. But at the same time, to, to as I said, to, to know what I'm here for, to know why we have that conversation, why I read, wrote... Um, why I write that paper or so I try to find that purpose first before I start doing the stuff because then I know in which frame in which context it's it's yeah so sometimes I, I even put it in my calendar for a specific important uh, meeting Yeah, I guess it's it's like we zoom in and zoom out almost, right? Uh, we, we zoom in on some details and then we sort of zoom out and then look at the bigger picture purpose. So so maybe that's a part of the skill set that we trying to be, become a little better at to to move between different perspectives of modes of thinking. Uh, there was this idea we talked about, uh, which Heiner you liked uh, about um, um, to to camp and decamp. That that reminds me a little bit about that. So it's, it's kind of like you when you consider an idea, you sort of camp there. And you you put on those glasses for a while and you, you try to see the world in that way. But then after a while, you can sort of go away from it and then see it from the outside. So so the idea is really this movement between different perspectives. Uh, and I guess that's also what happens when, uh, you know, when, when we listen to someone try to understand them, then we kind of tr see the world a little through their eyes at that moment and then later on might move, uh, move away from it. Yeah, three levels of power. Okay, was that? Uh... I would like to jump in, but only before I know where Joshua and Carl are on this. Yeah, well, uh, every everything we were just talking about resonates so much with with me i mean one of my as i posted a link to his website there uh, my primary mentor he talks about the three levels as being appreciation influence and control and we tend to just uh, when people hear the word power they're just thinking about the control level power the power over and then the influence is about the is the power with and 
uh, appreciation then is that power four. So that gets to that, what I was talking about earlier. Are there three, three corresponding levels of research? So I don't know if you were here for that, Joshua, but talking about research on our traditional research is research on you, you're coming up with your, your plan on, and subjects and all that stuff. And then there's a cooperative inquiry, which is John Heron um, wrote a book in 96 about that, but he talks about it being research with, and then that's what I, one of the areas I'm exploring is, is there that next level of a research for a real uh, research with a um, based on purpose. I was just going to say, um, just learning to be a consultant. I started, in, I think in 2000, I read a book on how to be a consultant. And it had uh, some specific things, which was, um, I'm trying to remember now, it was, you had to be published um, in journals, and then you had to teach, you had to lecture. And the last one, which I never did, was you had to write the book. So people say, you're the one who wrote the book on this subject, thus you can consult on it because you published the book. So as far as I got was writing a course for the university on that subject, but I never wrote the official book. It was just a course. And um, I just think it's really interesting when you're saying research for, well, every time I get a new client, I always ask them to do a discovery process so I can do my own personal what's for me to understand what their industry is or what their needs and problems to solve for me then with them and then look at how other people outside have solved those problems in that industry and it's really funny working on the internet everyone that's ever came to ask me for work says i am the only one who does what i do this is totally unique specific to me there's no one else out there doing what i'm doing and I think it's really interesting that they're right and they're wrong at the same time because there's no one doing it the way they're doing it because no one is them. And I think it's really important to realize that we really as souls and individuals are so unique and I can't have the life experiences that Heiner had or Carl had or Gertrude had or you, Glenn, like I can't be you, no matter how much time we spend together. And I think I know you and we have these long conversations and I feel comfortable talking to all you guys because I've gotten to know you, but I can't be you. I don't know your viewpoint and your experiences. And I think it's really important in every sector of every industry from medicine to fashion to you name it, is just to realize that we don't have exactly the same shoe size, even though it says the number is the same there's a millimeter off of your feet and we're really snowflakes. I know it sounds cliche, but it's really true. Each individual on this planet, 7.6 billion or however many are actually here, totally completely unique. So if we can recognize that difference, I've been trying to ask everyone that I'm working with, okay, this is great. You wanna help this group with this project, what do you want individually? And I try to ask my clients the same thing is what do you want out of this? Why are you starting this business? Why, why even do this? I mean, what do you get out of it? And I think knowing that individual why helps to build collectives and holes. So if everyone isn't stepping up with their individual why, it's really hard to put people together and work together because I might have crossover talents that Heiner has or that Gertrude has and why she wants to do it it's more looking at it at a karmic level of what karma is she going to be able to receive and i use that word as synonymous with action so it's her action of doing the work that she needs to do for herself not for the group maybe heiner can do it better than gertrude and faster but Gertrude needs to do that action because it fulfills something in her and it is the journey, like you said, Gertrude. It's the journey of doing it, not where the group wants to go or what it's trying to solve, but letting everyone in the group have their own personal journey fulfilled in a way that fulfills them personally. And thus, the group will eventually get to where it needs to go 
but each person will have grown in the group. And to me, it's that journey that's more important than the final outcome. I really truly believe that. I've spent a lot of time, but I'm, I'm complete. I just want to say. Yeah, thank you, Josh. This, I think that is uh, what Andrew came in with, not to, to melt into the group and I'm completely, because I want to belong. How would it be to belong because you're there, because you are you? So unconditionally, you belong because you're a human being, because you're whatever, you showed up. And, and I think that's what, what they call wholeness in, in the, the teal realm. And this is, how about you are welcome as such? <laughs> and from there, you can be authentic and don't have to trade that with belonging. You see? Yeah, thanks. You see, what we are tackling here is a very interesting question about how we are unique and where are our comments. And I'm in a global comments alliance with the civil society in the UN. So this is really my field. And to really Flound, we did this whole seminar in the 90s. So I strongly believe our telling, our telling stories here is very good and very important. But the stories are based on different uh, nuclei because especially in English, we use a lot of metaphors and Japanese and German is very grammatically, very structured. And so the African cultures are so immense. And this is how they got this great art going there. So I, I want to really try to take this uh, opportunity here to question your metaphors, Gertrud. Is it a flow? Is it a field? Is it a spectrum? How can we embody it? You were uh, using words like, oh, I'm here and now I'm using a microscope. Have you read these books on the microscope? It's a Club of Rome report by Rosnay, a French thinker from, from the mid 90s. We can, as humans, develop shared microscopes which taking which allow us to take ourselves out and see not the whole picture there's no whole picture but there are many common frames of references or maps or models who overlap who can communicate and and this was my struggle i was such a um, consultant like you josh in the early 90s and our task was to research all patent databases on in inventions which were hidden because it's sometimes much better if you make an invention to put it in a drawer or sell it high price somewhere that it is not made public and and, and closed so what we have been doing is looking into the macroscope commons where you agree on common maps and in these maps you can show overlaps without a position of yourself. So these are this multiple identities, I call it multimodal and camping and decamping as uh, Glenn just cited, not just in the physical world, but in the semantic world or in a cultural multilingual world. And what he found in, in, in a great interview was someone speaking, creating such mind maps or mind models or stories or story spaces to really include other senses 
other information which are not semantic, which are just color, sense, field, intensity, or whatever information. And that's why I was Fleming, because we had really the chance for more than 30 years looking into all this esoteric stuff. And I love the ESO and the exoteric. And I really developed such maps. I was building them. And it's just a matter how crazy can we be that we share them together without being put, it, put into a box of a vanity. So, I, for example, I just found out I was deleted in Wikipedia for being a vanity. I didn't find. Are we lost? For, no, what was that? The no, I, I didn't language? understand the word. For being what? A vanity. vanity. I had to look it up. So not a celebrity, but a vanity. Vanity fair. Mm. Vanity. So I really found out that these uh, terminators in Wikipedia, we spoke about Wikipedia before, if something is out of their box, so I'm not a scientist, I'm not a consultant, I'm not an artist, I'm not a journalist or an activist, I'm nothing. So anyway, it's very interesting to follow up and we had this fight about who is so uh, relevant no, I think Wikipedia terminators have other terms. Um, or if he if is not fitting a certain box, his management by champions being thrown out or killed. And what we need is this extra position without being crazy or to be put into psychiatry or asylum, because this happens to too many people. Yeah, so, so do you mean that sort of identity, many identities at the same time, uh, almost? Um, uh, what do you want to say, Josh? Yeah. I was just uh, thinking about what you were saying, Heiner, as far as, you know, you were labeled a vanity and having that credibility to speak isn't allowing you to, I'm sure you can cite your sources, but do they even care about you citing those sources? And it made me think about uh, when I started this company with a friend of mine, it's called the uh, Microbiome Learning Center. And um, we had to create the mission statement and I thought really hard about it for a year. And um, if you don't mind, I'll just share the, the statement is we exist to facilitate the study and research of the human microbiome. We encourage collaboration with health professionals, and I made sure to add this in there, and non-professionals interested in learning more about bacteria, fermentation, nutrition, and the human microbiome industry. And I made sure we had a big argument, me and my um, business partner is non-professionals. Why would we want to know what non-professionals say? Because what do they they don't know anything. They're not professionals. They're not in the industry. I think we lost uh, Heiner for a second. Um, but I just really feel what Heiner's saying is it's so important to have non-professionals researching with professionals so that we're not myopic and we're not looking at that microscope. And I think that continuity or collaboration or whatever word you want to use helps to grow any industry is looking at it from the outside and the inside at the same time. So it just made me remember why I put in non-professionals. And I think that's what's going on is all the non-professionals in the world have had a chance to speak and say what they think. And now we get to synthesize all that information and figure out what's real for each other. So yeah, non-professionals and professionals need to talk to each other because we have to ask each other the hard questions. And that's what I think we're doing here. I don't know individually, I've gotten to know Carl a little bit. I haven't had a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with Glenn or Gertrude, but um, I don't know what your professional life is. And the word professional just means you make a living doing it. So professional, non-professional doesn't matter to me. Uh, I think you're back, Heiner. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I was just saying that it's so important to be a professional and a non-professional. And uh, I'm complete.
may, maybe it could also be interesting to think about the sort of role of a specialist uh, versus the role of a generalist. Because uh, um, it, it's kind of like if there are many specialists who are, are really good at the very specific task, then we the role of the generalist might be more of a, a connector of people and, and, and projects. But, um, but, but in a way, it's because the specialist is so good at that, that the generalist might be free to do his job uh, better as a generalist. So, so there's a, an interesting uh, similarity there. But another thing which came to me when you said that about that we're all unique, and uh, that's obviously true. And it also occurred to me that actually, strictly speaking, I'm, at every moment, I'm unique uh, compared to what I've ever been before or, or will be later. So it, it actually reminds me a little bit when I watch the water and I watch the, the waves on the water. It, it's, it's so fast and it's always a pattern on the waves, which is, is totally unique. It's, it's never, probably never ever existed and will never exist again. And it's just, and that's like every single moment. Um, so, so, um, so when, but the, the thing I guess, which is a little, which sometimes seems to come up is that we speak about uh, uniqueness or differences in a way which seems to sort of, uh, it's framed as an opposite to similarities uh, while I guess this is probably a very deep philosophical question even, well, what really differences and similarities about? I mean, it seems to have a lot to do with consciousness, just how we frame it, right? So, I mean, just to take an example, it's like these two here, are, are they similar or are they dif different? Well, they're both structures, so they're similar. They both have a certain weight, so they're similar. They're both located in Norway, so they're similar. But they also have different weight, different colors, different densities. So it seems like it depends what we focus on. If we had enough time and imagination, we could probably find an infinite amount of similarities and differences between any two people. So. Uh, I guess that calls into question once again the metaphors that, that are being used. Another idea that came to me was this. I heard someone say once that there's the container metaphor and then there's the process metaphor, which container is sort of, th this is a container of water and we think of it as a container. But let's say I switch to process thinking then I might think about how the water is moving and how the atoms are moving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I guess that's also relevant to, to this sort of issue of how we define identity, personal identity, and what does it mean for me to show up, and what is my unique role and contribution. And so, yeah, those all, that's just some ideas that uh, came to me there. Yeah, that, that ties right into the framework I'm developing. In English, everything is the verbs that end in ing. It's the ongoing process, so it's resolving, it's resonating, it's emerging type of stuff. So. In German, we don't have that. Oh. We don't have gerundivum. It's, it's just gerund is... I mean, it's possible to do that, but nobody uses it. It's just <laughs> more structured. Yeah. It's like those Germans have yeah. a different yeah. word for everything. Actually. Well, I think what we're talking about is tenses and time and how we perf our perception of time is cultural and thus reflected in our language. And I think you know, for me, I was very fortunate to live in a place like Manhattan where the one block that I was on, and you can just go up and down the block. It was the Russians on the corner, 
then the Dominicans, then the Japanese, then the Iranians, then the Jews. And it was just one block. And they were just literally like, you couldn't have two Dominicans next to each other cutting hair because they'd fight with each other. So it almost had to be those separate cultures on that one block. It was really a special place. But what I got out of it was just all the different ways of looking at life from each one of these people, from each one of these businesses and knowing the people that ran the businesses. And, um, you know, I got to study Japanese a little bit. And there's a book I wanted to share with everybody called The Wholeness and the Implicate Order. And it's by David Bohm, who is the protege of Albert Einstein. And the first three chapters of the book, he takes the English language and breaks it down to show the separation of the language of English and how it's a great language to do science in because it separates with particles and tenses and, you know, it is the, in, a, all these little things, whereas I don't know the German language so well, but I know in Japanese they don't have as many of these particles they do have mo and to and go, but they don't have like in a plastic bottle. It's just bottle, not the type of bottle, not what's in it, not what it's, it's just bottle, bottle, water. And you can do that yourself. And I just think I, I go back to what my friend said years ago was speaking one language is like seeing in only one color. And if we're all seeing in orange and we collaborate in a group and say, let's paint the house. And we're all saying, well, of course it's going to be orange because we all think in orange that it's going to be orange. And uh, I do think we should, uh, in my opinion, we should spend more time getting to know the tenses and the verbs and the thinking and the understanding of each other so that we can synthesize that later to collaborate. But if you try to collaborate before you know where each other's coming from, it's almost impossible unless someone dominates and becomes the leader. So if you want true collaboration, take some time to get to know who's on the team. And I think that's what Tammy was trying to do right when I first got here into GCC. Um, Tammy said, hey, let me show you. I'm interviewing individual people. Would you like to be one of those people? And I said, well, how long does that take? Three hours? Oh, my God. I don't think I can do that. But it really, you know, if we all took the time to interview each other, that's what I've been trying to do. And I would love to, with you, Glenn, and Gertrude, and Heiner, I would love to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Just reach out to me on Facebook and Let's get to know what each other does because there's so many projects on my purview. I can only imagine how many are on you guys' purview. So thus we can connect and be generalists and help each other, even though we're also specialists in our certain ways. So I just want to put that out there. Josh, I love you for that. And sorry that I was interrupted for 10 minutes, but the Japanese and the German it's a bio-holistic language. They have, like the Indians, a ma and a ba, a different concept of space, which is really embodied and tangible. In German, we have the word schau. That's much more than seeing. But what I really wanted to say is that we, with the Bohm Dialogues and Karl Prebram, did the consciousness dialogue in Jubiliana, I can send you the link, uh, where we really looked what it means to consciousness, to awareness, to compassion, to all this. But all this needs people who dare to listen twice and ask, what do you mean? When we just use one language, then we have the inkling to say, oh, I know what he means. And then we kick him because he is not from our side. In Germany, there is um, um, like self-help guru, <laughs> um, Michael Lukas Müller. And he wrote a book about um, truth begins with two. And, and he, he had several rules about um, couple conversations, one of which was, I mean, one at a time and things like that, but one of which was, 
I don't know you. I, I just, you have to share and I can, I don't know you per se. Ich weiß dich nicht. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, and, and that's, uh, for me, it's, it's just, I, I, I come into a conversation knowing that I don't know you. If I don't, I'm, I'm just presuming from my whatever. And uh, I don't know, Heine, if you know the, the terministic screen, does that say anything to you or anybody else? Um, Dave Logan, he, he has written the, the, three, three, um, the three laws of performance. Um, and and I had attended a seminar, and he said, "Terministic screen that is like the words you have to express whatever the language you have, and that defines who you are in the world, and that like uh, a medical doctor uses other words than I don't know a plumber or so, and it was about consultancy." And, and he said, you cannot be a consultant if you don't know the terministic scream of the people you want to, to work with. So this is going into the world of others. So he had that term. So knowing the words that people use and the more terministic screens you know, the better you are in understanding people. Because otherwise they they might use, yeah, whatever uh, Heine already said, so we don't have to go into that again. Uh, but. I was just going to share, Gertrude, I was on the phone with a gentleman who's in a completely different paradigm. He's working on blockchain and cryptocurrency and he's mining and he's using all these new words that I had never heard of. And then he's using words I had heard of, but in a different way. I could tell the way he was using Um so at one point in the conversation, I asked him, can you explain sacred uh, decentralization or this kind of governance and how you use that? And we kept having a better and better conversation as I learned his vernacular. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's a really important thing to spend the time to pause people for a second and say, I heard you say that, but the way that you're using that is not the way that I perceive it in my mind thus i'm missing the whole rest of the next 20 sentences you say and it's so important it's scary to pause someone because you sound like a moron like huh i know that word but you're using it in a way that i don't know and you know being like you said humble or whatever word you want to use i call it curious but you know especially uh, the english language is a bastardized language of um I think the Persians had it for a while and then this people had it and then they're Germanic, you know, from Germany. And we've sucked in so many words from French. To, I mean, it is such a bastardized language. It is so. William the Conqueror. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we also have that was um, spread through uh, min wandering minstrels too. So the, the, there's like the word, the wordplay, too, that um, the type of stuff, all the pun, the puns and everything. It's yes, English for me is very idiomatic and very metaphoric. And metaphoric, like in analogies, it's very shifting sand, very difficult to get the other. That's why I, I work with some really interesting people on an encyclopedia of systems and cybernetics to really explain all these words, at least in the wholeness, healing systems environment, to give all the different meanings in different environments. And I think you, Carl, or Sam, should really suck this information in to really show when someone uses a certain term, uh, the four different applications 
and how this is typically used by people in politics or in law or in biochemistry or whatever. This is very helpful. And then really being able to do such conversations like we uh, do it here. Temi is very, very great on one-on-one -on -one and one-on-many. And, and I think what I did once with Temi was something, me in the hot seat, being asked questions and the group is answering. And then you have not just a one and one, but it's a much steeper gradient. But I think it's much more easy to scale up to larger groups. And my concern in our environments here, it is taking so long time and so many hours of video, how to really go. And if you use a term you don't get, then you're lost. Especially as me, as an alien, I don't understand most of the words. Then uh, it is really like an empty void for many of the people in the audience. That's why <laughs> our common conversation is always so boring or so oversimplifying and so full of overclaims that people are tired of listening anymore. How do we get access to, to what you just shared about? You're muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so this um, encyclopedia is available. We have a beta version now, which is online. So you can search your terms. And this encyclopedia of world problems, human potential action option strategies, three volumes done over 30, 40 years wow. by uh, the Union of International Association which is an NGO. So she, there was a um, clearinghouse for the U United Nations. They are just being degraded to just doing paperwork and the director is gone. But all this is electronically available. And that's why I think we should do big data, but also big wisdom and big knowledge because this data without structure and seeing all these big uh, groups now doing just with vacuum cleaners sucking in data, it is just good for <laughs> filling a lot of storage space, but it's very often even dangerous and misleading because when you know, then you maybe jail something for what you, for him, Mail him for something you imagine he has done. Maybe he has a wrong name or many people have the same name or some other strange things happened in, in the data collection. So there are filter walls and these filter walls are part of this filter bubble discussion. And this needs to be uh, addressed. Mm -hmm. Um, guys, I have to go because I have another um, date at uh, half past. Um, yeah. Is it? So I thank you very much for. No, um, Glenn is the host. Yeah. Oh, Glenn, okay. So I was just going to so say. So I, I just say goodbye and um, thank you very much. It was yeah. an interesting. <laughs> Conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all your input. Thank Me you. too. Bye bye. bye, -bye. And I hope Carl, you got something <laughs> to use for you yourself. Yes. Thank you, Gertrude. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's uh, time to to wrap up and not too long, but uh, um, I don't know if you have. 
what any finishing thoughts or anything that will come up with this? Uh, I just wanted to mention this to, to you guys. Um, I spent some time with the Google conference that came out a few days ago. It's called Google I.O. It's the developers conference. Yeah. And um, I spent all of last night watching all the developers meetings for web development because I'm a web developer. But it was really fascinating. They're giving us open source to all the tools to program artificial intelligence so that our websites can actually talk to you and talk back to you. And they created a thing called Google Duplex, um, which lets your computer in the background call human beings and have conversations with them on the telephone and then come back to you and talk back to you. So I just, if you get a chance, go to YouTube and type in Google IO 2018. And anytime you wanna talk about it here, it's really awesome that they're open sourcing and letting everyone create the AI world. But if we don't all do it, then someone else will program it for us. So it's not going to work the way you want it to work if you don't put in your code. <laughs> and it's almost, it's almost a, a obtrusive, like, oh, now I have to be a programmer of that code. I don't want to do that, but I know I have to. Otherwise, it will just happen around me and I won't participate in it. So I think that's a big thing is participating in this quote unquote artificial intelligent world that's gonna get created whether we like it or not. We have the chance to participate now. And if we don't, then it will be what it's gonna be without our participation. So I just wanna put that out to the group. Well, that, that's really interesting. So, so they develop tools that make it easier for the general public to, to program it. Well, was that it? Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't want to work with Google unless they open sourced it. And two years ago, the lady who came on the team from China, her name's Fei Fei Li, she said, I only come on the Google AI team if it's open sourced and I want to take a year long sabbatical to go around the world and introduce the open source to everybody because we don't want to create AI unless everyone's participating because that's the danger, because there'll be several AIs out there, but the Google one, they want everyone to participate in it. And I'm sure at some point in the future, they'll lock it up, but it will still be machine learning with humans programming it. So some of the examples were fascinating, which is um, their photo machine learning lets you take a picture of a spider, and then by using the big data, you can know if it's poisonous or not or you can take one of the young girls in the example took a picture of flowers and depending on the disease of the flower it will show you the remedy and the cures to take care of those plants so when you look at it in that sense there's a lot of great things we can do and i'm sure there's a lot of terrible things like the police department in the united states wants to put cameras where when they look at someone they can identify all the background knowledge of them and decide you know, prejudge what they're going to do. But the possibilities are endless of what we can do with AI and big data. And if we all participate, it could be really cool. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's really scary and cool at the same time. It's like freaky, but awesome. And unavoidable, like you say, you know, we, I think it's going so. to happen anyway, right? So we yeah. might as well take responsibility for the process. Yeah, keep an off button and <laughs> keep an off button and no surgical implantation required. <laughs> I want to remain Carl one of one, not, <laughs> not the board. <laughs> yeah. I was at the Republica in Berlin last week and there was such talk about it, but it was also the talk on algorithm and whistleblowing. So uh, I think we have to be very much aware uh, on the context and the values all we already mentioned around the data. I find it very challenging what's happening. We have now a very big um, Google um, development center here in Berlin. They started a very big European operation here because the creative people are not just on the West Coast. 
And I think the moves to open up, I think, are strategically very wise what Google is doing. And the also, also the changes. Just uh, remember Goethe and Faust. So um, just having uh, the source code and being able to program yourself can be um, a very nice uh, way in developing uh, operating systems. I think there we have very nice examples, always Linux. But in, in the application side, we have shown through the liaison, I think it was with Google and IBM and Watson, that um, such artificial, artificial intelligence were shown as being totally dangerous because the computer finding out who is leaving a company is uh, the person who was overworked. And so the computer algorithm fired the people who have already stress in their job because something, some external factors were in the way. So uh, all these discussions, I invite you to also look at all these public Republica um, videos, which are also around. The question is, how do we get to the nuggets? And that's maybe why I'm here, because here are some people who are not just talking, but who have also seen a few things. So thank you very much. I say, that now, I say now for the third time, bye-bye. Over and out. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Then there were three. Yeah. Trilog. Yeah. yeah. I think this is uh, this is real really interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, the, I guess we had, there is this maybe a. a reinvention of the entire i don't know relationship with data maybe which yeah it's to, i, I just want to say does anybody like either one of you guys i don't know what device you use on your phone but the google assistant works in android and ios for apple and um the google and what they announced, what I thought was really cool, is that they're letting you program from your phone. So they're putting the operating system to program inside of the actual phone operating system and the Chrome OS operating system. And you can make things. So the idea is that everyone can program, but the way that you program is a very different thinking because it's artificial intelligence. So you can tap into the engine and utilize that to gather the data before you do the output. So I'm just saying, the more we write the programs, the more different sectors, kind of like the internet itself. Like I can go to one section of the internet and say it's disgusting. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to 4chan, but- <laughs> Just briefly. Four, uh, yeah, exactly, just briefly, cause it's so like, whoa, oh, I can't even look at that. It's like, ugh, but I think, Eventually, I'll be able to say to the computer, um, what is Glenn thinking today? And the computer says, which Glenn? And I say, Glenn Gaslam. And it says, oh, hold on one second. Let me check with Glenn. And then it checks with your AI. And then it has a conversation in the background. And it tells me. And then I contact you. So it's kind of like a living Twitter, if you will. Like, I'm looking at it as a positive way. That your AI talks to my AI. You guys your AI and my AI figures out all of the large conversations so we can have a very focused conversation when I talk directly with you, Glenn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, Carl? Oh, that gets right into um, Doug Engelbart's stuff about the computer as a tool to augment our capability. So having a, his ultimate, I guess, is like a networked improvement community of augmented humans. And stuff. So that's, yeah, I guess it can. Be I think people. Think yeah. What were you saying, Glenn? Yeah, I think it might be a real big breakthrough. The moment we can actually talk to the computer and uh, it can well, that, easily fully understand. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. That's now, as of right now, at this moment. If you download the Google Assistant, you can have a conversation with it completely. 
in contextual, you don't have to say, hey, Google, and then talk. You can just talk contextually now. Okay, okay. So, and, and does that remember the previous conversations? Um, yes. Because what, what would be really awesome, of course, is, is if we could program in such a way that we could give verbal instructions and then have a program which could somehow read that and do the folding work for us. So that's the program they're giving you, 13 million downloads. They put it out two years ago and they've been refining it, refining it, refining it. And in the next three, year, three to five years, it'll get so refined that you don't need to be a computer scientist or a Google expert. You can just sit at home and tell your computer what you want it to do for the program and that will be programming it just in plain whatever language you're in japanese or spanish or english you can just talk to it but then you get to decide how you want that information to interface with the other information right. so yeah. private conversation versus public conversation and i that's what i've been working on with collaboration groups is everyone wants to collaborate with everybody and they say they do like for example on our uh, gcc team in base camp the only person that i saw any activity was uh, i think alex reed who went on there as anonymous and i was like who is this and he goes oh it's alex and i was like why are you being anonymous if it's like people want to be open but they don't but they do but they don't so I feel like if you create a project and you have two teams, one is your public team and one is the private team, then you can transfer information back and forth from private to public, public to private, and get some synergies going. Yeah, but, but it's like funny because I haven't really written all that much in there either, but it's, I mean, um, so sometimes it's, it's almost like I don't really know where to start because there's so many, ideas I have and I wonder how to formulate it the right way etc so um, actually the times when I find myself actually writing a complete article is very often when someone asks me a question in a Facebook thread and so um, but, uh, but, but I really it might be really revolutionary when you can begin to talk with your program in a meaningful way I mean it's and that's uh, that should open a, a totally new world. Um, yeah, if we have like intelligent assistants, which can really assist us, almost like a therapist or or, or coach, um, and like like a good helper, because that seems to be the the direction, right? Which this could be any. Yeah, I mean, it's scary and awesome at the same time because the more you interact with it and then the more you put that out to the public, the more that my assistant can have more information because you interacted with it. And that's sort of the game we're playing right now is how many people are going to be programming in that. It's 13 million now, but I'm hoping in the next two years there's 300 million people because of the fact that you can actually program it on your Android phone it'll actually work on the smartphone to program. So it's gonna be very interesting to see. Google's done their programming, now they're asking the world to share in it. And I think there's probably gonna be 20 to 50 different AIs out there, like Google will be one of them, and then you'll be able to talk to another artificial intelligent. And it's exponential to the point where now I'm blown away. Like I, I looked at your stuff, Carl, the brain, I actually went on and it was $249 to get the brain app. But I just wonder when everyone connects all their brains with all the other brains. And um, that's the way I look at the internet right now is it's there to access, but it's just not clean. It's not a clean communication of what we're all, we're just not post like, when I build databases, I create a taxonomy. And if we're not using that taxonomy, then the corruption of information happens quickly. Same with conversation. Yeah. 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 Big data is a sample size of everything. Yeah. It's, not, it's like what, what are correlations and <laughs> yeah, there's a whole spurious correlations. What 
right out there that uh, so like guy heiner was saying i mean big big knowledge and big wisdom yeah <clears throat> and, and and of course the the data is always uh, experientially interpreted and it, it depends on the context and people and uh, so it's, it's kind of like when, when i read something on the screen it's a little different from reading it in a book a little different from reading it aloud so um i i guess it's almost like the the written data is is a kind of potential potential for something and, and the internet like i say is full of data but it's like it doesn't have any specific structure i guess um but but so this ai so if, if but, yeah I was just having one question, so I was if just I understand it, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, go first. Uh. Oh, I was just going to say that the programming is not the way we used to program, where we type in text into a field and the mm -hmm. taxonomy. It's voice contextual. So, if I say yes, or if I say yes, or if I say yeah it's actually picking up on those nuances and programming that way. So we're, that's why I'm thinking if more people are using it and it, it is that futuristic world where we thought we would get to it and we're actually there now where it can pick up on tone of voice and contextual and actually start to do machine learning. And um, a lot of people are thinking it's algorithms. It's so much more beyond algorithms. It's, it's, yeah, it is. I can't even talk about, I'm just going to use it, but take a look. Just uh, all I can say is try it out. Take a look, start to use it each day. I've been doing it for a year now and I've been watching it get better and better and better and better. But now that they launched this conference, give it, I would say about July is the time to check in at the end of July, check in with the Google assistant and see what it can actually do. Cause right now it's saying they're doing a million things, but it's working with the internet of things. So it's going to be exponential of what you can do with it. And I'm starting to program for websites. So if all the websites are connected to it, then it's just going to explode beyond our, the speed huh. is going to blow our minds. I think by November, it's going to be as natural as talking to you and me. Really? Yeah. So, so you just download the app, Google assistant, right? Uh, download that app to start with and then go to go the Google IO conference and they give you all the different programming languages to interface with it. So one is um, Google lens that lets you put the camera on things and use the photography machine learning. And the other is Google Duplex, which lets you allow the computer to talk from behind the scenes. So you get to pick 32 different voices and then you can program in your own voice and all the nuances of yourself. Hmm. The Google Duplex is not out yet. It'll be out. I think they said after July for the public, but they're using it right now. So it's, this really sounds yeah. like just Douglas Engelbart's vision, right? Uh, of this uh, augmented uh, uh, machine learning together with a person. So we sort of learn together, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, that's really, really exciting. Uh, so you can download it on iOS too, on uh, iPad, for example. Or, yeah, if you haven't used the Home Assistant, start with that. That came out about three years ago. And it, um, what it does that I like is now you can ask it two questions at once and it can compartmentalize like a human being. It doesn't have to just have one question. It can do two questions. Hmm. So who was, who was the greatest um, thinker during the Dottis period in Paris? So you're asking it, that's actually one question. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the example they used was a sports analogy, which wasn't very good for me. Wow. But um, like who was the president when 
this sports team won the championship. So we can actually think contextually that way now. That's wonderful. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to just being able to, let, let's say you go for a walk and you just talk with the program and then when you come home, it's written documents where you get some kind of, um, yeah, a, a good uh, report, I guess, from topics. But that's, so you, you yeah. can program that. If you want that, you can program it and say, from this point and this point, when we're talking, store that into this area and then put it back onto a piece of paper stylized with material design this way on the document. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've yeah. been following this because I know as a web developer, I'm going to be out of business in two years because you'll just say to your computer, uh, make me a website on this server or with this use case. And I want it to have this theme and I want it to use all of the conversations I've had over the last three months, organize it by this category and post it. Hmm. And, and you'll preview it and see how it organized it. And then you'll go in and maybe by hand individually say, no, I didn't want this one or this one, but yeah, let's keep this one. And now your website's completely done. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I think that's uh, awesome. It's really, really great. Another thing that I wonder also is, is about this with 3D or virtual reality, uh, you know, whether we might be going to away from devices. Uh, at least I know for for my own, I would prefer it if if I could just see the information in the air, for example. Or uh, I mean, not having to look at a device all the time. I guess that's what they tried with Google Glass, but but it takes some time to really really get those technologies going. I guess. Yeah, look at well, um, MIT and um, Patty Mayes, M-A-E-S, and um, then there's a tangible user interfaces lab that, um, uh, yeah, the one of the one of the guys that from that um, tangible interfaces lab was um, consulted with them for the Minority Report movie there, where Tom Cruise is throwing yeah. things up to the side and stuff. So. Yeah, there's yeah, it's all it's all done now. I mean, they have the ATAP lab at Google where you can move your finger to change a millimeter of a dial. And that's all done by LIDAR. So if you want to program anything you could ever imagine, like when we were kids and we watched these movies like Minority Report or iRobot or whatever, anything you could ever imagine, all the tools have been open source given to us and we can create any world we want to create. And I think people that bitch about the world that gets created are the people that didn't participate in it. And that's, mm. to me, that's on them to, if you want to complain about what someone did for you, you know, without your knowledge, when they open sourced it and said, you have the chance to participate. If you didn't, that's on you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, and, and it's going to be so much easier when you actually can talk naturally with it instead of doing the you know programming yourself. Yeah. So I was. I wonder if I can uh, turn on my Google Assistant right now because I'm looking at the solar panel, seeing if I have enough sun. Because we got some Whoa. full sun. Whoa! So. Awesome. Let me see if I can, uh, before I go, because I'm. Talk that's the other thing is we talk about stuff. We don't show stuff. I noticed with the GCC, we don't share our screens. Oh, well, we do sometimes. Yeah, I, I sometimes. did earlier, actually. Oh, okay. Cool. Sometimes. I think it's nice to show, show stuff. Yeah. We okay, should well, probably do it I've more. Got it I've got it on, so you can talk to it. Just say H-E-Y uh, and then Google, and go ahead and ask it anything, Glenn. Um, I know it's, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, hello, hey, hello. Google. Yeah. What's kick the temperature off. right now? In 93274 right now, it's 71. Hey, Google, who am I? 
Your name is Joshua. Okay, Google, turn the volume to 10. Okay, Google, who was the best painter in 1917? According to Wikipedia, Andrew Newell Wyeth, Wa Fadeh Wyeth, July 12, 1917 to January 16, 2009, was a visual artist, primarily a realist painter, working predominantly in a regionalist style. He was one of the best known U.S. artists of the middle 20th century. Okay, to read Google, more, look for the... Where were they born? On the website census.gov, they say... Lifetime mobility. Most people in the United States live in the state in which they were born. Okay, Google, pause. The so I was trying to do contextual, but I had to wait for it to finish for a second. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Yeah, shut up, Google. Uh, <laughs> but you can play, like, ask it. So right now, it's mostly coming from Wikipedia. So I'm saying the people that are programming the Wikipedia, it's pulling it from that. But what Google's asking us to do is program your own stuff so it pulls from that. Yeah, so so basically, it's like you you put uh, something into each AI, which you say this I want to share with the world, and then all of that which is shared is just automatically transported to the other AI. So for some common repository, right? Um, yeah, and it and it's it's supposed to search all of the applications like the. Android apps and inside if you embed the AI to it, it'll search the data inside those So it's trying to get more um, It's really interesting as you use it meaning um, Okay, Google. What's my favorite color? I Don't know that yet. What's your favorite color? Blue Okay, I'll remember that so that's what I mean by the programming so now I ask it, okay, Google, what's my favorite color? You told me that you like blue. Ah, so, nice. But it's also connected to my Google ID with Gmail. I have it on my personal one, so it knows everything I've done for the last six, seven years with Google. Ah, nice. So it pre-programmed quite a bit, but then it's also very clear right now not to freak people out. <laughs> That's why it says you told me to tell you this. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, you can freak people out a little bit. Uh, I, guess, I mean, it's. Oh, yeah. Just gotta do no, the best can, out of it. Yeah, like when yeah, I say, <laughs> when I say good night, it says, okay, good night, don't let the bed bugs bite. And if they do, I'll call an exterminator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it tries, so right now for the public, they're trying not to freak everyone out, but it could really freak you out like hardcore. That's why they got rid of Google Glass because it was freaking people out. So they just canceled it. Yeah, I also kind of felt that the design of Google Glass wasn't so successful. I, I mean, that was just my feeling. I just, because they kind of looked almost like normal glasses except they didn't look like normal glasses so i mean may maybe it had something to do with that too uh, yeah I people were getting beat up and in, in san francisco they were physically getting beat up because people couldn't tell if they were recording or not recording okay and you you could see because it was just one glass they didn't have it look like glasses so it wasn't innocuous like carl's glasses right there could be google glass but it didn't look like that. So you knew that someone was there recording you and people were like, are you recording me? And they were physically hitting those people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah well. So mm. well, see how it develops. It, do, you, but, uh, do you want to try it, Glenn? You, anything you want to ask it? I was just giving you examples. Uh, I'll just try to download it later. I mean, if I can okay. download it on the iPad, Mini, I'll, I'll definitely do that. So, yeah. And, uh, but but this, yeah, this is this is great, and uh, it's certainly a, an opportunity to really engage with that process. So, uh, yeah, I think we're probably coming to an end here. But uh, any mm -hmm. any final words you want to say here, Carl? Or uh, nope, uh, mind blown here. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I was trying not to blow anyone's mind. I was keeping it very simple. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Google, play epic theme music. Playing Tetris main theme on YouTube. Here's our outro music. So it starts. Okay, Google, play epic theme music. Playing Tetris main theme on YouTube. Tetris. So it decided that this was the epic music that I wanted, and it changes every time I ask it. It gets different epic music. So this is our outro music. Yo. Uh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll definitely look at that Google I.O. Because... Uh, so, um, this sounds pretty epic, yeah? Uh, okay, Google, pause. Yeah, the, the YouTube database is the most epic part because it taps into all of YouTube, so you could ask it anything that ever existed because it's not Spotify. It actually is everything on YouTube. Whoa. So it's totally absurd. Okay, Google, pause. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's uh, wonderful. I'll definitely check that out. So, but uh, now I, I'm ready for some dinner, I think. But uh, yeah, we touched on a lot of subjects today, almost three hours. So, that's a good call. So, but thanks. Uh, thanks thanks to both of you for Great to see you. showing you. up. So, I'll try to. Store this recording somehow. I haven't done that before, so well, hopefully it's gonna work. So, yeah. Okay, let me know how it goes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank bye you. Bye. Cheers.